Take your Bibles. Let's turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18. And we're going to read one verse of Scripture, verse 15. Deuteronomy 18, 15. While you're turning to Deuteronomy 18, 15, let me just tell you that if you've ever looked closely at the book of Deuteronomy, almost the entire book is a quotation. It's a speech. Moses is talking. He's talking to the children of Israel. They are about to cross the Jordan into the promised land. But if you remember, they had been wandering in the desert for 40 years. And all of, well not all of, but virtually all of the first generation who had come out of Egypt during the Exodus had died in the wilderness. So these are their children that he is talking to. They are the new generation of the Hebrew children. And so Deuteronomy is basically a review, a summary, a, a, a recital of parts of Leviticus, Numbers, and Exodus. Moses is basically reviewing the history of the Exodus and imparting that to the new generation that is there about to continue their legacy as they cross the Jordan River into Canaan. So, in chapter 18 and verse 15, if you would stand with me as we read this verse of God's Word, Moses tells these people, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. Now that verse has an immediate reference to Joshua. It has an ongoing reference to other prophets that would be risen up throughout the course of Israel's history. But ultimately, that is pointing to who? Jesus Christ. God will raise up a prophet among you like me, and you shall listen to to him. This verse is quoted multiple times in the New Testament referring to its greatest fulfillment, the person Jesus Christ. Father God, this morning as we go through Hebrews chapter 3 and we begin uh, looking at the content of this great chapter, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to whatever truths it is that you would have us to learn today. Lord, bind Satan from this place and allow us to focus on your word and your will for our lives, God, and help us, Lord, to experience your presence among us this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're being seated now, you can turn back to Hebrews chapter 3, where we will pick up our series on Hebrews, Jesus is Better. I wasn't here last week, and Brother Toby did an outstanding job in my absence. I appreciate you guys being hospitable and welcoming to him. He had a great uh, time being here last week and spoke on the Holy Spirit, I believe, is what he told me. And uh, it was a great, great day in the Lord, and I appreciate again y'all letting us go. But uh, it is good to be back this morning. I don't know if, if you remember, time goes quicker than it used to, but a few years ago, we did an entire series on the Exodus. We walked all the way through that period of history and the related chapters in the Bible that year in our study of the Exodus. Let me give you just a quick review. After almost 400 years of slavery, the Lord chose a man named Moses to deliver his people from the Egyptian bondage. If you remember the miraculous story of Moses' birth and, and they were killing all the Hebrew boys, the Egyptians were, and uh, Moses' mom trying to protect her child, put him on a reed basket and floated him down the Nile River. You remember that? Knowing that Pharaoh's daughter and her maidens would be bathing at a certain time of day, she strategically sent the basket down, and, and Moses' sister Miriam followed closely behind, watching it from, from afar, from the shore. And sure enough, the Pharaoh's daughter found the baby floating in the river, had mercy on the child, but knowing that it was a Hebrew child, she wanted a, a Hebrew mother, 
to, to wean the child, to, to bring the child up. And so what did she do? She kind of looked around and thought, we need to choose somebody, and here comes this little girl out of the woods. Oh, surprise, surprise. And the little girl says, hey, my mom can do it. And the rest was history, so to speak. Moses' actual mom brought him up during the early years of his life. Then when he got older, he grew up uh, with his, his adopted brothers in the palace and learned the ways of the Pharaoh and the Egyptian monarchy, if you will. Ultimately, we could go through his whole life story. We have a, 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 just a, a great amount of details there. But ultimately, Moses ended up in Midian tending sheep. And at the age of 80, God called him to return to Egypt where he had grown up in the Pharaoh's house and to deliver his people, the Hebrews, from Egyptian bondage. And if you recall, God sent ten devastating plagues to prompt Pharaoh to let God's people go. Pharaoh was pretty dang stubborn. He said time and time again, I'll let you go. And then he changed his mind, didn't he? Over and over. But finally, Pharaoh relented with the death of the firstborn. The Hebrew children left, but only a few days after letting them go, that crazy Pharaoh changed his mind again, and he and his army started chasing after them. And you remember what happened? They caught up with them on the shores of the Red Sea. But God's children, though trapped, cried out, and Moses cried out to God. God parted the sea. The children of Israel walked across. Pharaoh's army was in hot pursuit. When they came out the other side, what did God do? He closed the sea. And all of those Egyptians drowned there in the sea. From there, Moses and the children of Israel wandered a little while longer. Water from the rock, manna from heaven. The story just goes on and on. Ended up at Mount Sinai where they stayed for approximately two years. And God gave them the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law. Also showed them how to build the tabernacle. We went through all of this in detail. From there they wandered up to the edge of the promised land to a place called Kadesh Barnea where they were about to enter the promised land. They sent some spies into the land. The spies came back with a bad report. They did what us Baptists do. They voted on it. Not always a good idea. The majority said we shouldn't go in. They didn't go in. God was angry and rightfully so because what was the entire purpose of the Exodus to begin with? To go into the promised land. It was clear what the will of God was. It was plain, but when the time came for them to do it, they didn't do it. And so they wandered in the wilderness for the next 40 years, as you recall, 38 years. And virtually all of the original generation died, save Joshua and Caleb. Finally, Moses led them to the plains of Moab on the eastern border of Canaan. And now the Jordan River was all that separated them from reaching their long-awaited destination. And Moses there graciously stepped down as being their leader. He passed the torch to Joshua and then, as it tells us in the book of Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Moses climbed to the top of Mount Nebo, Nebo, where he died. That's the story of Moses' life. From that point forward, we know that Joshua led the children into the Promised Land, and we call that period the conquest, and we'll do that sometime in the future. So y'all keep coming. You're not going to miss that right. Moses, beloved, is regarded and revered as one of the, if not the, greatest prophets and leaders in Jewish history. God used Moses to rescue his people from Egyptian captivity. His faithful obedience to God's call and his faithful uh, adherence to the Lord's leadership in his life directly led to the deliverance of the Hebrew children. Yet, even in light of Moses' great significance, 
we read in Hebrews chapter 3, the writer tells us that Jesus is superior to even Moses. The title of the sermon this morning is Better Than Moses. Better than Moses, if you can imagine that. Better than Moses. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read the first few verses. The first point is called a comparison. A comparison. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses was also in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. The writer of Hebrews begins this chapter by inviting the readers to consider Jesus. Did you see that? Consider Jesus. You know what? In light of chapter 1, in which we said Jesus is a better messenger than all of those prophets who came before him, and he brings a better message than they brought. In light of the fact that Jesus is the divine Son of God and is better than the angels, he's exalted above the angels. In light of the fact that Jesus humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross and became a man and is a better man than any other man that ever lived, in light of the fact that we are warning you, do not drift from your faith and your walk with Jesus because if you do so, you how can you escape if you neglect such a great salvation? In light of everything we've talked about in chapter 1 and 2, in light of all those things, let us take a moment and just consider Jesus. You know, if you're ever down, if you're ever depressed, if you're ever struggling with something, I invite you to take a moment and just consider Jesus. Just get quiet, set your mind on Him, and allow Him to calm your restless soul. He calls His his recipients of this letter, you notice there, holy brethren, Partakers of the heavenly calling. Obviously, as we've stated earlier in this series, he's not writing to to, uh, pagan people or to people who have no knowledge of the gospel. Obviously, he's writing to people who have at least some connection to the church, maybe some even allegiance to the church. Uh, It doesn't necessarily mean that they're all saved, but they are people who who, uh, have been partakers, at least intellectually, they've heard the gospel. And I'm sure there was a mixed bag. Some probably were saved and others were probably playing the game, just like we do today. But he invites these people, consider Jesus. And look what he he says there. Look what he calls Jesus. The apostle and high priest of our confession. Do you remember earlier this year we did a series on the twelve apostles? And one of the one of the launching verses for that series was this verse. Because you notice here he calls Jesus the apostle. Do you remember from that series what the word apostle means? One who is sent out. One who is sent. So if we take that as the meaning of apostle, which it is, what is the high priest? The high priest was the one who was allowed to enter into the holy place on behalf of all of the people and to make an offering or a sacrifice to provide for the atonement of the entire nation. So if we consider Jesus using these two terms, here's what we have. Jesus is the one who was sent by God specifically in order to make a sacrifice that would secure the Lord's forgiveness for humanity's sin and would bring about reconciliation between God and man. He was sent by God, the apostle, to offer a sacrifice for sinners, high priest. Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus, our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to him who appointed him. 
Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him. Who was him who appointed him? God the Father. Right? God the Father appointed his son, Jesus Christ, and sent him in order to accomplish his divine will, the salvation of mankind. Listen, Jesus was faithful to the mission that he was called to do. Look at the latter half of that verse. As Moses was also in all of his house. You see, Moses was faithful too. Moses was faithful in the house of God. And so here we have the comparison. Jesus and Moses. Both were faithful. But if you look at the first part of verse 3, for he has been counted, he is capitalized, referring to Jesus, for Jesus has been counted more worthy or counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Listen, both men were faithful, and yet it tells us right here that Jesus is more worthy than Moses. Why? They were both faithful. Well, let's continue through this. So the second part of this is a correlation. So we set up the comparison between Moses and Jesus. We even stated the conclusion, Jesus is greater. But now we're going to talk about why Jesus is great. We're going to give the evidence behind the conclusion that was stated at the outset. We're going to look at a correlation starting in verse 3b through 6. Let's look at that together. By just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For, <coughs> excuse me, for every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house is a servant for a testimony for those things which are to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast to our confidence and the boast or our hope firm to the end. Listen, there's a phrase there that I want you to, to see there in the latter part of verse 3. The builder of the house has more honor than the house. That statement is the basis or the, the foundation of the correlation that is being made in these two verses. The builder of the house has more honor than the house. Listen, houses don't just come into being on their own, do they? They don't just spring up. Ooh, look at that nice house. It wasn't there yesterday. It just popped up. No, that's not the case. It takes a, a builder. It takes someone to design the house, to, to, to come up with the structure of the house, and then to orchestrate the construction of the house to, to make all of that happen. It, it is a process. Listen, one of the greatest arguments for... God being the creator of the world is the existence of the world. When you go into a city and you look at skyscrapers, logic tells you somebody built that. It didn't just pop up out of the ground. Things don't just spontaneously appear. That's not scientific. It's funny how the scientists are the ones that defy science by telling us to believe that things just spontaneously boom, there it is. That doesn't happen. The creation demands a creator. It's common sense. The house is not greater than the builder of the house. Spiritually speaking, Jesus is the builder of the house. And the house as we see in the latter part there in, in, in uh, uh, the end of that, the last verse of that in, in verse, uh, what was that, verse 10? Um, verse 6, I'm sorry. The house is us. The house is His people. Simply put, Jesus is greater than His people are. <laughs> Jesus is greater than humanity. He is God. We are not. Now, I want us to go back for a second and look at the previous verses a little bit more carefully than we did when we read through them a while ago. Look at verse 2. Jesus is faithful to him 
who appointed him, while Moses was also faithful in all his house. There is a subtle difference there. Do you see it? Jesus is faithful to the builder of the house. Moses was faithful to the dwellers of the house. Now here's the question. If the builder is greater than the house, does it not stand to reason that he who is faithful to the builder is greater than he who is faithful to the house? Are you tracking with me? You see, the the literary device that he uses here was intentional. He was showing Jesus is greater than Moses. Even more than that, look at verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. In the previous verses, he said the builder is Jesus. In this verse, he says the builder is God. So what does that mean? Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Well, that alone makes Jesus greater than Moses. Moses isn't God. Moses was a great servant of God, perhaps one of the greatest servants of God, but Jesus is God. Look at verse 5 very carefully. Moses was faithful in his house as a servant. Look at verse 6. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house. Moses is a son. I'm sorry. No, he's not. Moses is a servant. Jesus is a son. Moses was in the house. Jesus is over the house. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than Moses. Now, before I leave this point, I do want to say something. It is important to point out that faithfulness to God and faithfulness to His people are not mutually exclusive. Okay, in this passage, the writer of Hebrews is making a comparison between being faithful to God, the builder of the house, and being faithful to his people, the house itself. But he's making that comparison to make his point that Jesus is greater. Nowhere does this imply or mean that you can't be faithful to both. Right? As a matter of fact, I would argue, and I think you would agree, that if we are submitted and faithful to the Lord naturally there is going to be some degree of faithfulness to his church, to his people. Right? I mean, I don't see how a person can be faithful to God and to God's word and to God's commands and to God's will and at the same time shun all of the people. That's impossible because his will says (laughs) so much about loving and fellowshipping and, and serving one another. So the two things aren't mutually exclusive. So I don't want you to read this passage and say, well, you know, either we're faithful to God or or we're faithful to his people and being faithful to God is better and and being faithful to his people is, is secondary. That is true, but it doesn't mean that they are exclusive and distinct and separate from one another, right? But I will tell you this. If you ever come to the place where you must make a choice of whether to be faithful to God or to be faithful to His people, who do you choose? God. Okay? But I will tell you this also. Sometimes what God is calling you to do is to be faithful to His people when they mess up. 
What was God calling the children of Israel to do? To go into the promised land. Moses knew it. But when they chose not to do it, did he leave? No. God told him to stay with that rebellious, stubborn people. So it's not always as simple as making that distinction. You've got to know, and you've got to pray, and you've got to be in God's will. But the point is this. Being faithful to God and being faithful to his people, though they are used for the sake of comparison in these verses to show the superiority of Christ, they are not mutually exclusive from one another. There is bleed over as, as there should be. Let's look at the last point with the few minutes we have left. It's called a consequence. So we had a comparison, we had a correlation, and now we have a consequence. The last part of our message today actually is a citation from the Old Testament. Chapter, I'm sorry, Psalm chapter 95. This specifically is verse 7 through 11. If you, if you have time later this week or even right now and you want to turn there, I'm not going to because the words are printed right here. But that, that quotation, these verses come from Psalm chapter 95, verses 7 through 11. This ancient psalm was written by David. But, as all Scripture is, David, the writer, just like the writer of Hebrews who penned it and, and repeated it and cited it, was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So when you look, let's look at the verses there, starting in verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, you say, no, David said that, no, David wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which again is an affirmation that the writings of David, and yes, the entire Word of God, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they, as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me, and testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. David was writing about the Exodus in his day in, in, the, in Psalm 95, talking about the children of Israel who resisted God, not just uh, on one or two occasions, but they grumbled and complained every single day for 40 years. They griped and complained about, about almost every situation. They were hungry. They were thirsty. God help us. I wish we'd have stayed in Egypt. This whole thing is a disaster. I'd rather be in bondage than out here wandering in the wilderness. Please, Lord, Lord, hear us. I, uh, I guess you've disappeared. You're gone. You're helpless. You know what we should do? We should make a golden calf and worship it. That'd be a great idea. I think that would be better than, than worshiping Moses. Obviously, he's left us on the mountain. He's never coming back. So some old boy named Korah decides to lead a rebellion. The ground has to open up and swallow him and all of his cohorts. Time and time again, grumble, complain, rebellion. And God finally says, okay, you know what? You guys can wander in the wilderness until you die. You will not enter my rest. What does rest mean there? Well, it's, it's talking about the promised land. He says, look, I'm going to let you wander in the wilderness till all of you die. And then the promise of the land flowing with milk and honey will pass on to your children. And we know that it came about exactly like God said it would. Save Joshua and Caleb, not a single one of them, including Moses, crossed the Jordan River at that time and went into the promised land. They weren't permitted. Moses plainly declared the will for the Hebrew children was to enter and take possession of the promised land. That was, that, was, that was the entire mission of the Exodus. 
And as I stated earlier, he bravely led them to the southern edge of the promised land, positioned them perfectly in a strategic area to accomplish the Lord's directive. And they ignored God. They ignored the miracles that he had done for them up to this point. Apparently, they forgot about the Red Sea and God's ability to take out an entire army and just like that. Apparently, they forgot about God's provision with the water from the rock with the manna on the ground, with the quail from heaven. Apparently, they forgot about the ten plagues in which God re rendered the most powerful nation on earth at that time hapless and helpless to keep them from leaving. Apparently, they forgot all of the Lord's faithfulness to them, and they saw these guys that were bigger than them, and they shook in their boots, and they said, We can't take this land. And they said, No, we're not going to enter. They disobeyed. They refused to enter Canaan because of misplaced fear and anxiety. Beloved, I'm glad that we, are, we don't miss out on God's best today because of misplaced fear and anxiety, aren't you? Sarcasm. Sarcasm. Verse 11 is a... It's a disturbing verse. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beloved, there are consequences to rebelling or refusing or disobeying the stated, clear, plain will of God. The rest that is mentioned here will be developed throughout the rest of this chapter and in chapter 4. If you've got subtitles in your Bible, look at, look at the subtitle of chapter 4. The Believer's Rest. And so we're going to talk about God's rest over the next few weeks as we continue to explore this. But for today, let me wrap up. I want to close by pointing out just a couple of similarities between Moses and Jesus, and perhaps maybe these will help us to to have a better appreciation of both of these remarkable men, because they were both remarkable in their own way. Jesus, obviously, infinitely more so. Moses was sent from sent to Egypt from his home in Midian. Meanwhile, Jesus was sent to earth from his home in heaven. Moses was sent with the express purpose of delivering God's people from the Egyptian captivity. And Jesus was sent to deliver sinners from their slavery to sin and death. Now, I want you to hear this next one. Moses successfully brought the people out of Egypt. Jesus died to secure the forgiveness of all sinners. He so successfully delivered us from sin. But he does not compel sinners to receive it. You see, God crushed Pharaoh and the Egyptian army and set his people free. In the same way, Jesus forever crushed sin and death and set sinners free. But listen, freedom from bondage is useless to the one who chooses to remain in bondage. Let me say that again. Freedom from bondage is useless to the one who voluntarily chooses to remain in bondage. Though they had been rescued, the children of Israel chose of their own free will to wander in the desert and to die outside of God's promise rest. Beloved, how many sinners today will continue to grope around in the darkness of this world, will stumble around blind and helpless, and will ultimately die and spend eternity separated from God, although sin and death have been defeated 
by Christ on the cross of Calvary, and all they have to do is overcome their doubt, overcome their stubbornness, overcome whatever it is that they have in their own minds. Beloved, there's nothing keeping them from making the decision. Jesus has set them free. Their chains are broken. Their bondage is gone. They are now free to choose salvation, and yet thousands go to hell day after day, year after year, simply because they choose not to enter God's rest. What a horrible truth that is. We would rather walk around in the darkness than to live in the light. My friend, as we wrap up this morning, let me tell you, there is absolutely no excuse for rejecting Jesus. None. Perhaps that's why the punishment for doing so is so seemingly harsh. I would argue it's not harsh at all, but that's a different sermon. There's, no, there's nothing keeping us or anyone from accepting Jesus. The only thing keeping anyone from doing it is their own refusal to do so. The process made. The debt has already been fulfilled. Why would anyone choose to wander in the, in the wilderness? Jesus delivered us from sin. And death. We have been set free from its bondage, from its captivity, from its enslavement, from its change. You pick the word. Nothing, nothing keeps us or prevents us or restricts us from receiving salvation. Nothing. No one. Satan can't even stop it. No one can. Listen, metaphorically speaking, Satan and, and all of his minions are still soaking in the Red Sea. We're out. We're free. All we have to do is say yes and go in. That's all we got to do. Jesus will bring us into his rest if we will just allow him to do so by giving our hearts and lives to him. That's all that is. Father God, thank you for today. I thank you for this message. I thank you for showing us through the writer of Hebrews how much greater Jesus is than even Moses. Jesus is our great deliverer. Jesus set us free from the bondage of sin and death on the cross. Jesus has forever delivered us and shown us the promise of eternal life through his resurrection. Lord, Jesus has broken every chain of sin, every scourge and wall of the devil against us. And he has said, if you will just confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God, help us to truly believe and confess you every day. And God, help us to communicate this message with those around us whose destination right now is hell, but yet have every opportunity, God, to turn and repent. And nothing would prevent them from doing so, Lord, other than just us telling them and them coming under holy conspiracy conviction and giving their heart and life to you. Help us be messengers of the gospel here in this community and around the world. God, if there are any decisions that need to be made during this invitation, let them be made. For we ask it in Jesus' name.